Good afternoon, everyone. Um, if everyone could grab their seats. Um, thank you all for being here. To get us started, uh, we have Atlantic recording artist uh, and star of the Fox TV show, uh, Glee, um, actor Alex Newell, who's going to kick us off and sing the national anthem in all of his fabulousness. <laughs> I found it. Is this it? it sure is this one it? Sure. Oh. oh, there it is. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm just going to start singing. Is that all right with you? Stand up if you like. Yes, gosh. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proud Held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming. That our flag was still there. Who oh, say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? Well, if that isn't a welcome to the White House, I don't know what is. Um, but good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the White House. Thank you, Alex, for kicking us off this morning on such a fabulous note. I could literally listen to you sing all day. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us for today's LGBT Artists Champions of Change event, particularly timed following Transgender Awareness Week and Transgender Day of Remembrance. My name is Aditi Hardiker, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the LGBT liaison to the White House. And thank you. <laughs> And I should note that, that the term LGBT uh, that we use is an umbrella term um, to make sure we encompass all of the queer community, including queer, gender nonconforming, intersex, allies, and other identities within the community. The Champions of Change series allows us to honor everyday Americans making a difference in their communities. So thank you for being here and sharing your amazing art and work with us today. A special thanks to Amazon, Focus Features, MWW, and the Ally Coalition for helping to make today's event possible. And now I'd like to turn it over to a champion within the White House who tirelessly advocates for marginalized communities across the country, including the LGBT community. Senior Advisor to the President, Valerie Jarrett. Thank you, Aditi. Thank you for everything you do each and every day. Just know that there is an amazing uh, team of advocates here in the White House and none better than our very own Aditi. So another round of applause for her. <laughs> Listening to Alex sing was something else. I listened to every word and I was thinking, what better way to kick off this amazing Champions of Change than to hear Alex do that wonderful rendition. Could we also another round of applause for Alex, wherever Alex went. So a couple of weeks ago, Aditi and I uh, traveled to New York together, uh, and I was uh, privileged to accept uh, the Ally of the Year Award on behalf of the President uh, by Out Magazine. It was a terrific event, and it gave me an opportunity to really reflect back over the progress that we've made the last seven years. And I'll talk about that progress in a second, but what I will remember most about the event was not me getting to be up on the stage and get an award, which was very cool, trust me but a young man who came up to me afterwards and he said he wanted to talk to me for a second and I leaned in and he said, I came out today to my mom. And I said, you did? And he said, yeah. 
because seeing the president on the cover of Out Magazine and reading how he feels about me made me realize I didn't want her to die without knowing who I really am. And he started to tear up, and I said, well, how did it go? And he said, not well, not well at all. And I said, you know what, it does get better. And I said, does your mom love you? And he said, yes. And I said, then I promise you, it will get better. But he really made me realize the power of leadership. And it's reflected in all of you who have worked so hard, who we're going to honor here today. It's reflected all across our country. And because I had a chance to speak on behalf of the president, I did reflect back on the last seven years, which have been extraordinary, thanks in large part to your hard work. Because what we're doing is important in terms of what government can do. And so when the president signed the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Hate Crimes Act, that was very important. And I'll never forget Judy's face that day when he took a position not to defend DOMA, when he repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell, when he um, instituted visitation rights, when he ended the travel ban uh, against people who have HIV um, or AIDS, and we were able to host the international conference here for the first time in decades, uh, when he came out in favor of same-sex marriage, when we had that extraordinary day, a Friday, where I had the privilege of calling the president to say we had won at the Supreme Court, and not only does love mean love, but no longer is there same-sex or gay marriage, there's just marriage. That word has changed forever. And I'll never forget calling him. And I said, uh, the Supreme Court decision came down today, 5-4. And he said, who won? And I said, we won. And he knew exactly what I meant by we won. Because really what I meant was America won. And I'll never forget being in the Rose Garden uh, with him that day with so many of our young staff who care deeply about this issue regardless of what their gender identity or sexual orientation might be. We all were in this together. And I will never forget, he said, we take a couple steps forward, a couple steps back, and then suddenly, like a thunderbolt, we make progress. But we all know those thunderbolts only happen when people like you work tirelessly day after day after day. So we're going to take whatever steps we can possibly take over the next year, and really important things happen in a fourth quarter. So don't rule us out yet. Just last week, the president supported the Equality Act, which is another big thing Congress could do. Uh, and of course, we did um, honor Transgender Remembrance Day, and particularly the women of color who are disproportionately attacked and discriminated against. And it was kind of a bookend to a bullying conference we had very early on in the administration uh, where so many children, so many children are discriminated against and tortured. And you know what? It's not a rite of passage anymore at all. It shouldn't have been when I was a kid, but it certainly can't be now because the power of the internet can be so destructive. And we did meet a couple of weeks ago also with a couple of moms of children who'd committed suicide at a very young age. One was 11, one was 14. And they're now dedicating their life to trying to ensure that no child is discriminated against because of their sexual orientation or gender identity or for any other reason for that matter. So we've done a great deal, but we still have work left to do. And for that, we want to honor the champions of change, and we want to challenge all of us to figure out not to rest on our laurels, but to keep moving that arc of the moral universe towards justice. Champions of Change is really my favorite event that we have here because uh, it makes me hopeful. Sometimes in Washington, you can lose that hopefulness. And what it is all about is honoring ordinary people who have done just extraordinary things, extraordinary things in their communities. And so I want to introduce each of the champions. When I introduce you, please stand so we can clap for you, and I'll give a little description of why you are so important to us. And then, um, and you don't have to hold your applause or anything like that. Appla clap whenever you want to. <laughs> why would you ever hold your applause when we're celebrating, right? Um, all right, so our first champion is Marco Castro Bojorge. Where are you? Stand up, stand up, come on. So Marco is a community educator in Lambda Legal's Western Regional Office in Los Angeles and produced and directed several short films and documentaries. This year, he premiered El Canto del Colibri. Is that close enough? All right, you said it better than I did. 
or The Hummingbird Song, a documentary about Latino immigrant fathers and their LGBT children as they come out. So thank you for that wonderful piece of work, and we celebrate you. Next is Fiona Dawson. Fiona, up you go. <laughs> All right, so Fiona has a hometown advantage because she's from nearby Silver Spring, so she clearly came with her peeps. Um, <laughs> we're, we're excited to have you here, too. So Fiona established Trans Military, which promotes gender transgender equality through media that educates, entertains, and inspires. Having co-directed and produced the short opinion documentary Transgender at War and in Love, commissioned by the New York Times, she's now working on the, fe the feature length version of the film. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, St. Louis's own Jesse Duke. Jesse? <laughs> Jesse is an artist whose work explores issues of gender, sexuality, identity, and community. She's been photographed within LGBT communities for the past decade, and she is deeply committed to the transformative power of the portrait photo. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have Lee Livingston Purine. Up you go. <laughs> you also have a hometown advantage because you're uh, the founder of the Makers Lab right here in Washington, D.C. Makers Lab builds and supports queer communities by creating spaces that celebrate life, art, and queer culture. Since launching in August of 2014, the lab has produced and has been has produced and has been collaborator in the production of 35 cultural events. Congratulations. We celebrate you. <laughs> Next, Joanna Hoffman. Joanna? Uh, so Joanna is a 12-year veteran of competitive performance poetry, or SLAM. Her work explores bullying, homophobia, racism, and mental health, and she, conducted, she has conducted poetry workshops with youth, youth at LGBTQ community centers, performing venues, high schools, and all across our country, high schools and colleges all across our country. Thank you very much. <laughs> Now, A.J. King, where are you? <laughs> also from D.C., <laughs> serves as the founder of Breaking Ground, formerly known as Brother to Brother. This program targets men and trans youth of color in Washington to tell their life stories through musical theater and uh, identifying nonviolent conflict resolutions. The program incorporates social justice training, leadership development, and safe spaces for the participants to disclose their life stories and unique issues, and then present their stories on stage. Thank you so much. <laughs> Next is Pigeon Pogonis. Is that close enough? No, say it how you would say it, so I get it right. Oh, goodness, all right, that was pretty good. Thank you. Great. Pigeon is from my hometown of Chicago, and yes, Chi Town, thank you very much. Okay. And is an intersex activist fighting for their community's human rights to bodily autonomy and justice. Since 2006, they have made an effort to expand the visibility of issues related to the intersex community by facilitating workshops and presentations around the world. Pigeon was honored with a 30 Under 30 award by the Windy City Times, a renowned voice in journalism that highlights the important topics and emerging leaders around LGBTQI communities. Thank you very much. Thanks for representing.
Next, L.J. Roberts. L.J. L.J. is a visual artist who creates large-scale knitting installations, incredibly detailed embroideries, screen prints, and collages. Their work investigates overlaps of queer and trans politics, activism, protests, craft, and the ongoing AIDS epidemic through an intersectional feminist lens. Thank you very much. And finally, Steve Romeo. Steven. Steve is the founder, executive director, and primary artist for the Change Project, which is based in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm from Tuskegee, Alabama, so you're like my home away from home, okay? The Change Project is an LGBTQ arts and storytelling organization that seeks to transform discrimination against all LGBTQ people into acceptance through the art of photography, social media campaigns, educational resources, and partnerships with social justice organizations. Thank you so much. So as I said at the outset, President Obama is gonna do everything within his power to ensure equality in our country means equality for all. And that's the reason why he moved, was motivated to go into politics in the first place, and it's what has motivated him each and every step along the way, and it's why we want our honor of you. But we also know that there are limits to what we can do here in the White House. And the best way to improve our culture is to change our culture. And the best way to change our culture is to involve all of you. The arts has always played such a fundamental role in improving the quality of our culture in our country. And I think our champions, the nine champions and their stories and their commitments to change really embody the power that we have by using the arts as a force for good. And so I wanna congratulate you all. I also wanna give a particular shout out to the amazing crew from Amazon's Transparent. I'm hooked, I can't wait for the next season. Why don't you guys stand up? All of you who are a part of Transparent, come on, come on. Don't be shy. It's really, I'm telling you, I assume everybody in here has seen that show, but if you haven't, do watch it. You're gonna fall in love with each and every one of you. You're a unique family in certain ways, but you're really not at all unique in other ways. Every family has those relationships, so I'll say no more. It's just like a teaser for those of you who haven't seen it yet. Uh, also those from the Danish Girl. Come on, up and at them. Thank you, thank you, one and all. Thank you, and the Ally Coalition. Who's here from the Ally Coalition? I know there's some of you, come on. Come on, everybody. Well, sadly, my role is over. I have enjoyed it immensely. I've been looking forward to it. Again, just thank you, thank you. Not just the champions, but those of you who came to support the champions. We know that their work is hard some days. Sometimes you probably feel a little lonely a little frustrated, you feel like maybe you're not making as much progress as you want to, and I know you get your strength by those who support you, both here and those who are watching online, so um, I want to just thank everyone who's participated. And now, we're going to begin our first panel, and I'm going to ask Alex Alexandra Billings, uh, who's one of the stars of Transparent, to come up and get us started. Come on up. you could all attend my meeting. <laughs> the National Transgender Meeting. Um, I want to <laughs> uh, I want to welcome our guests. Uh, I won't give you a, a long bio because I want them to talk. They are they are uh, indeed prolific and varied. So I really want you to hear from them. Uh, please welcome back. You applauded them once. Please applaud them again. 
Marco Castro Bojarez. Please welcome him back to the stage. No? Sit down. Sit down. <laughs> Sit down. Oh, pigeon. I started at the top. You sit down, Marco. I got the wrong page. Pigeon pajones, please. Thank you, darling. No, don't be sorry. I wasn't reading. You could, do you want to sit next to yes. me, pumpkin? Please do. <laughs> Jess Dugan. AJ King. Darling. Oh, look at that. L.J. Roberts. And Joanna Hoffman. I got the right people now. <laughs> we spoke on the phone, you remember that? That was a good conversation. I want to say before we start, can I say something to say something? I think we need to be really mindful before we go into this that this is not only historic, all of us in this room, but I think it is divine intervention at its most astonishing. I am of a generation where something like this not only would be impossible, it would be illegal. So I think in order for us to continue changing the world, we have to remember that there are people on the outside that need to be comforted, educated, and honored, especially the voiceless. So I want to ask you, we have a lot of work ahead of us, don't you think? And in the arts, it's, I believe it's not only our duty, it's our responsibility. How do you believe life reflects that? Or do you believe it's the opposite? Do you believe that art reflects life? What do you think? Do you want this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it moved. Um, I think I'm just going to give the, the typical feminist answers. It's both and. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's both and. I think art has always inspired the best of life. And I think life is totally influenced by art. Like, that's just my answer. Yeah. So I'll give a more biographical take, perhaps. But I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas looking a lot like I look now. And from the time I was very small, it was reflected back to me that there was something different about my gender. Um, and I moved to Boston, Massachusetts to go to high school with my family. And I, that was where I came out around my gender and my sexuality. And I didn't see anyone who looked like me in the mainstream um, at that time. And the first place that I really felt uh, that my identity was validated was in fine art photography books. I discovered work by Catherine Opie and Robert Maplethorpe and Della Grace Volcano, and that experience for me was so profoundly moving and transformative that I think art has this incredible power to reflect ourselves back to us and to validate who we are in our innermost selves. S so that's a... Um I think it's a very loaded question, and I think that it's there's a lot of different ways to answer that. But um, in a nutshell, I feel like everyone's life is art, and I think that every experience that an individual goes through is uh, an artistic expression about how they um, deal with it on a deal daily basis, so whether it be positive or negative. And that's why I think that the work that a lot of the champions are doing is so impactful because it's able to take people's stories and their life and their life and their achievements and their challenges and turn it into a painting or turn it into a theater or documentary and I think that it, it's so amazing because through this the vehicle of arts it provides um, not only that self-reflection and that self um, love and nurturing but also allows a more public audience to kind of understand that and relate to the artist and relate to the the art in general and um, Implement it into their own lives. So I think that that I think that everyone's life is art. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is that I left home when I was thirteen, and around that time I started reading a lot. I mean, I was always a reader, but I was exposed to books by Maya Angelou and um, Toni Morrison and Dorothy Allison, and 
a little bit later on June Jordan, and there was a lot of intellect happening, but they were also really working from their gut at the same time. And so I always knew I was gonna do something in the arts, and I thought it was gonna be a writer because there were these people that were very disenfranchised and coming from very marginalized communities, and that's the way that they had agency and a voice. So it came in terms of um, telling, you know, sometimes through fiction, but sometimes through nonfiction or essays, these really personal accounts that were really charged with politics. And for me, I'm interested in the intersections between arts and politics, but that comes with a lot of auto, autobiography. And um, so I think moving forward with my own practice, it's modeled on having the intellect there, but also really working from my gut. So I bring myself into it um, as well as, I mean, I have an, an incredible community, so all of their stories also, you know, I take into consideration too. But that's what I look for, I think. And, and that's who I relate to and, and people that are also um, make in creative production. Um, I think that life definitely inspires art, but I think that art has the potential to make everyone's life better, I think, because art can really transcend a lot of the barriers that exist or that um, people imagine exist between them and other people. And I think when art brings about human connection, that's <clears throat> the best possible outcome it can, it can take. And especially when it can engender compassion and empathy and allowing people to really feel a connection with someone that they might not think they could. I think that's how we move forward as a country and as human beings. Talk a little, this is interesting, talk a little bit about um, what it's like uh, being, because our queer community is, uh, 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 cracks open the sociopolitical idea of not only what art is, but the transformative properties of it. And I believe that comes from a specific source, our own, uh, you know, we have a very specific tribal and communal upbringing. Talk a little bit about why you do what you do and how you, where it comes from. What is the source of your artistic voice? Um, so for me, it's healing. And I remember the first time I was trying to make a film about I was just trying to write my story, and I, had a, and I had recordings of my mother from 10 years ago when I first found that I was intersex, um, and we were fighting, and she was, uh, you know, upset. And I had to listen to these tapes and transcribe, and I started crying, like, and shaking, and I just left the house, and I didn't touch it for another six months. And when I finished the film, finally, it's been like a complete circle, a healing process. Um, so for me, it's directly, it's, direct, it's directly related to healing, even just coloring lately, <laughs> or watercolors, um, is, some pla is a place where I can heal and feel and breathe slower. <laughs> so for me, that's where it comes from. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, I completely fell head over heels in love with photography, and I was immediately drawn to photographing other people. And my first real photographs were of my own chest surgery experience um, and of my community, my transgender and gender variant community that I was a part of at that time in Boston. Um, and I've always felt so strongly that it's really important to make kind of like you were saying, representations that are very humanist and very authentic that people can relate to, who, whether they're within the trans community or not. Um, so I've spent the past 10 years making work within the LGBT community, but the thing I'm doing right now that I'm really uh, passionate about is I'm photographing and interviewing people who are transgender and gender variant and are over the age of 50. So I'm traveling around the country for that project. I'm working on it in collaboration with my partner, Vanessa Fabre, who's a social work researcher. And we're doing the photographs and interviews together. And the reason I think this is so important is because we're able to show people of a very diverse um, community and people with very broad, diverse experiences, but also tell their story and allow people to connect with them in a way that is 
hopefully meaningful and transformative. And for me, that's where my work comes from. Personally, it allows me to relate to the world around me, but I, I, it also allows me to uh, facilitate interactions between viewers who may not know anything about the trans community or may not be comfortable and the subjects who have such important stories to tell. So um, when I was a child, I remember being age six and I wanted to be an actor. Um, I used to be at recess playing I Know What You Did Last Summer and chasing everyone around with a hook because um, <laughs> I wanted to be in horror movies when I was um, older. Um, but so I, I kind of followed that passion of acting and when I was a teenager I joined an organization called City at Peace and it is an amazing organization for youth um, that puts them through social justice trainings um, and really has self-healing and uses theater as a vehicle for social change and um, it opened my eyes a lot um, because here I was this African-American and Latino gay man who was living in the suburbs of a predominantly white um, area, uh, pretty conservative, uh, and I, I didn't have the tools and language about of, of a lot of things to identify about myself. Um, and this agency really opened my eyes to that. So um, fast forward a few years, I started working for an LGBT youth organization called SMILE. And a lot of my youth that I w was working with, uh, many were uh, young trans women and homeless black gay men. And they, they needed a lot of resources, and they, they, they weren't available. They didn't know how to, to get them. But one thing I also noticed about them, they were also extremely artistic. They were so talented, whether it be in singing or acting or drawing. I just saw so much potential in them. They just needed a place to really um, have a platform to, to show it, right? So it got me thinking, how can I utilize the arts to um, you know, tell, tell these individual stories, especially focusing on these communities of color, because there's a lot of um, separation within our own community of uh, brown and black, trans women, and gay bisexual men. And uh, many times there's th this separation causes a lot of violence within the community. So um, I was very intentional in recruiting for this program um, young uh, individuals who are homeless to people who are making um, large salaries working for the government, right? Um, and everything in between, because I, I really thought that we needed to break these barriers down and allow a platform for them to uh, really have the hard conversations and uh, notice a, how, much, how similar we really are. So um, it, I think that's where my passion comes from, just my love for my community and um, finding a way to use the arts to, so, so they can show their craft. Um. I guess the first thing that comes to mind is I was born in late 1980, and the AIDS virus was pretty much named the, a couple months after I was born. And so I was having sex ed in 93, like very bad sex ed at an all-girls boarding school about an hour away from here. <laughs> and um, at that all-girls boarding school, there, you could take field trips on the weekends, and there was a field trip to see the AIDS quilt the last time it was laid out in its entirety on the, the mall here. And it took me two weeks to put my name on the list. I was so, I mean, that's how much inner phobia I was dealing with. And, and, and I was the only person to go and like went with a chaperone and we didn't talk the entire time. And so at once there was like <laughs> the, scope of the, the scope of the epidemic hit me really hard. And there had been a personal situation in my family that, you know, I was also kind of like had really murky details around. And I was also like, okay, art and okay, there's art here, and I was also getting my first queer vocabulary from the AIDS quilt. And I like bought a t-shirt, and I wouldn't wear it in front of anyone, but it was my first piece of queer ephemera. And, um, and then, of course, like the dykey girl was kicked out of the boarding school a few months later. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I then became really interested um, in college. I was still really interested in art and kind of it, its um, connection or I guess confluence with HIV and AIDS and I started discovering groups like Grand Fury and Little Elvis and Fierce Pussy and Dyke Action Machine and they were like all putting arts on this art on the street and then like ACT UP was pressuring the government to get people treatment get people medications release medications and do something and it came really intersectionally and I was like that's that's transformative you know that's like art putting pressure on a government that's not reacting to a crisis that's killing people. And these people have become my, I lived in, I've lived in Brooklyn for the past six or seven years, and these people have become my mentors. And so in my practice, like, I show on the street a lot, 
and I show in institutions and galleries, and that's what they're doing too. And it's become really important for me to be in galleries and museums because there's a total, like, non represent not non representation, but there's a lot less representation of women and trans people in these institutions. So, but then I have to be on the street too. So I like have to. I'm such a Libra. I have to be like on the street and institutions and like balance it out. And if I'm in institutions, part of that has to go on the street. Um, so. For me, I see art being transformative in like a way where you take a place in culture and, and these big institutions, but you're also like on the street making change in a way that's like very accessible for people or hopefully accessible to as many people as possible. So I, um, <clears throat> I began writing poetry at a young age and it felt like the first safe space for me where I felt like I could be authentic and really get beyond a lot of the fear and the internalized homophobia and the self-doubt I was feeling and have the courage to tell my story and to talk about my feelings. It's really the first space where I came out to myself was through my writing and uh, got involved with the spoken word slam poetry community about 15 years ago and it was just so incredibly transformative for me to see other people on a stage talking about experiences that I could relate to in some way. And it made me feel so much less alone in what I was going through. And so I started performing at performance venues and at high schools and colleges around the country. And I found that I would have LGBTQ students come up to me afterwards or find me online and talk to me about how intensely they were being bullied and how alone they felt in their families and in their communities and in their schools. And that's part of why I now try to seek out performance spaces where there are few, if any, openly LGBTQ people because I think it's really important for kids in those spaces to see someone who they feel like they can relate to and they can feel less alone and see that poetry could be a space for them to tell their story and that people wanna hear those stories. And so in the one woman show that I have, which is called um, The Personals, Political, The Simple Truths, um, it you know, came about in thinking about how you know, people might not necessarily, people in my life might not, not have necessarily thought much about issues that affect the LGBTQ community, like hate crime legislation or anti-discrimination laws, until they realized that they knew and cared about someone who was in that community. And so I think that you know, having people relate to political experiences from a really personal level is how we can inspire people to base their political beliefs on empathy and compassion instead of these vague notions of what people think is right or wrong. So that's what I'm trying to do with poetry. Yeah, it's the right or wrong that gets us, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Because we're really hooked on where this thing is correct and this thing is incorrect. I was thinking, especially while you were talking, Pigeon, that I don't think that there are, I mean, I know it's true for me, that there are a lot of people who understand the word intersex, what it means, I know. And uh, you know, I know for me that I sort of become the queen of transgender people. Like every time I'm in an interview, people are like, how is RuPaul? I don't know how RuPaul <laughs> is. No idea how RuPaul is. I'm sure she's fine. <laughs> so I, the commute, the, <laughs> the, the, it's not like we all go to the same meetings, we don't. But uh, I, I, I wonder, <laughs> The intersex community is uh, its uh, certainly misunderstood, but highly underrepresented. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Oh, for sure. Um, so what is intersex, right? I was just thinking, thank you. You read my mind. Um, intersex is people like me, but pe intersex is people like me born with um, sexual traits that don't um, fall under what's typically male or female. Um, we're one in 2000. Yeah, and that's the UN latest report is between 0 0.05 and 1.7%. And that higher, higher range is the same amount of redheads. I'm trying to see if there's any red, oh, I see one. So if you've met, oh, not natural. Oh, there's one, there's one. Yes, get it, get it. Thank you, thank you. Oh, and more, all right. <laughs> so, and, um, so basically, if you've met a redhead, you've met an intersex person. So we are pretty popular. But the thing is, is the, sti the stigma out there and the shame that we all face keeps us underground pretty much, even though there's been activists since 1990s, like the early 90s. And, um, like, and then just to be out and then to take that step next to that or 
after that and be an activist, that means we were just talking, me and my intersex friend over there, um, we were just talking about how many activists do we think are in the world? And then we're like 50, maybe 100 at most. Della Grace Volcanoes won. Um, so yeah, and not only are, are we born in here, but our bodies, like you said, right or wrong, and we get obsessed with that, we're, our bodies are considered wrong just for being born the way they are since the beginning of time. And every day in this country and the world, um, little babies are getting their most sensitive uh, parts of their bodies, their genitalia, um, quote unquote corrected. And, and that's wrong. And the UN just came out about a month ago again and said this is, these are human rights abuses and violations, and they're recommending to states to do something about it, to stop doing these things, make legislation, follow the country Malta, what they've recently put up for trans folks and intersex folks. So, and art. I recently started making this thing just called Intersex is Beautiful because I felt so um, horrible. I felt so ugly, so, so because like people had to correct me, I felt like there was something so messed up with me so I'm using art to kind of let flip that narrative and help other folks be proud of being intersex. So that's another way that art kind of changes life and, and then that whole circle back forth. Thank you for bringing that up. Of course. Um, that was remarkable. Yeah, you okay? Everything all right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, everything. You want some water? We have to get, okay, all right. Everything's fine, Pigeon. You're doing great. How are we doing on time, darling? Are we all right? Oh, we have five, five minutes. We have to go soon. I want to ask, because uh, I feel like I want to go down the line again with all of you magnificent artists and just say, I, I believe in hope and I believe in, in, in the promise of, the, I know we have a lot of youth out there too. I met a lot of them, you young, beautiful children. And uh, bless your hearts, young adults, big pardon, young adults. <laughs> and uh, I, I, you know, we stare in the eyes of, of, of the future constantly, and I think it's why we tend to work from a place of, of um, cure and a place of health. Uh, and sometimes that brings a, a, across a cracking in us. So uh, I wonder if you could talk just briefly as we, as we close what is it you can you feel you can leave us? What can you tell the youth? What can you give them? What can you say to this generation that's coming up? And let's start down here with Joanna this time. What can you give them that inspires them to live their life uh, truthfully, honestly, and openly, and share their art in a way that will be revolutionary? And the first thing I would want to share with them is that they already exactly, they already are exactly who the world needs them to be and that they don't need to change anything about themselves. And um, also that, you know, I don't think that it just gets better for everybody. I think all of us, and that includes straight people, I think every single person has a role to play in making it better. And not just in the LGBTQ community, but I think it's important for us to look at intersectionality and to look at how we can all be really acting in allyship to examine our own power and privilege and to be responsible and to do what we can to make the world better for each other. Um, I guess the, my first instinct is that it doesn't I think there's all sorts of things that inspire people and so it doesn't have to necessarily be like a huge art, ep epical, epic art thing. like and that everyone has hard times and that kind of whatever you can grab onto to push you through. Like, for instance, if I'm having a really hard moment and I feel like I can't do anything, this is gonna sound, I don't know if this is gonna sound weird or not, but like I watched Serena Williams win her championship matches yeah. and like that's like what I grab onto to, to keep me going. And um, so I think it's kind of like you find that thing that you can grasp onto at the moment and I don't know, watching her like, get those points and and then the press conference after I'm like okay she can do this and like if she can do this like I can get up for the day and, and at least accomplish like something because we all have our bad days you know and 
um, especially if you've like struggled throughout your life, and and then I certainly have. But man, watching watching her win, that that's what works for me. So. Um, so I think that. So I view life very interesting, right? So I almost view life like a movie. And it's something that, um, I, some things I can't control. There are some things that are just left in God's hands. And, but I do know that I have the power to rewrite my own inner script of what that looks like. And what that could mean is that I, I have this script that is set out for me, right? Where I'm supposed to uh, graduate high school and go to college, then get this job and you know, find a wife and two kids and a dog and a white picket fence and all that, right? That's the script that's laid out for uh, all of us, pretty much, right? Um, a lot of, for my, for my youth, I like to instill in them that they have the power to rewrite that script and to, to fit themselves because everyone has different goals and different dreams and different experiences that no one's gonna be able to explain uh, or, or understand, shall I say. Um, and so w once you find that empowerment within yourself, that's when you can go ahead and make the decisions of the path that you want to choose for yourself. But with, that's not an easy process at all. So that means building up your support team, finding people who are like-minded to you in similar interests, whether it be um, you know, Serena Williams or you know, whatever the thing may be. Uh, find people who uh, have your best interests at heart, team up with them, and um, set your goals together. But make sure that you, you are putting your own goals uh, first. I think one of the most powerful things we can do is to continue sharing our own stories and to be a beacon for younger folks who need to just see that there are LGBT adults of all stripes who are happy and functioning and authentic. We can talk about our struggles as well. Um, but one of the reasons I really wanted to start the project I'm working on is that I had a younger trans man tell me that he had never seen an older trans man, and he had no visuals for what he would look like as he grew older. And you know, for me, that's just incredibly important to capture that history, to realize that we are a part of a much larger community and group of people. It did not begin with us. It will not end with us. And so we can both pay tribute to the people who paved the road to get us to this point, and we can do what we are responsible to do to continue paving that road for all of the youth who will come after us. Um, there's a quote in my film by Audre Lorde that says, your silence will not protect you. So I think that quote, keeping that in your head can help. And also to know that your silence can protect you sometimes and get you, keep you safe in certain moments. So you can go at your own pace. You don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to, live up to anybody's pace. And, um, and I think also we need reparations for intersex people. But um, yeah. like doctors, come on, give us the money and let us you know, <laughs> move on. But, uh, and we need justice too. But I think we need, we need that for black folks in this country too who were slaves, right? Who s suffered that. We need reparations for lots of people in this country. And I think the root of almost all evil, um, not evil, but like all the problems is like, kind of out of racism to me. And I'm starting to think heaven is a place without racists. So I think to leave to the youth, is just that, that struggle that we have, and to find community, that's what's kept me alive in Chicago, you know? And I had this amazing community in Chicago that's really about fighting against police brutality and racism, and that's where I was raised in that community scene. There's no intersex activism in Chicago, right? But um, I got to take the best of those things and put it towards my, my, my story, my journey, whatever, my community's journey. So I guess that's advice too, like learn from other folks and then adapt it to what you need to do for your community too. And always fight the racism, because like, I think since day one, since I was a kid, that's the, only, that's the first thing that kind of got me into thinking about social justice and, and the world and things like that. That was beautiful, thanks you guys. <laughs> Help me thank this panel, won't you? Help me thank this panel. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.